Hello everyone. Our topic for today is autosclerosis. We will be discussing this topic under the following headings that is definition, etiology and pathogenesis of autosclerosis, types of stepedial autosclerosis, the symptoms and signs classical of autosclerosis, the investigations which we do to diagnose autosclerosis and how do we manage this situation. So let's move on. So what is autosclerosis? It is a common hereditary disorder that is derived from otic capsule. Now, the inner ear develops from the otic capsule. So what happens in autosclerosis is the normal lamina bone is converted into unorganized bone and this is done by osteoclast. So the osteoclast remove the lamella bone and convert into the unorganized bone which has increased thickness, vascularity and cellularity. So this was the basic definition. Now we'll see about the etiology and etio pathogenesis of the disease. So the etiology, so the ratio is more in females, it is 2 is to 1 and the chances of uh, suffering from autosclerosis increase during pregnancy and puberty. Why? Because the autosclerotic activity is more during this time. And this disease is usually bilateral. It presents in third decade. And the most important point is that it is autosomal dominant. Now, I told you it's a hereditary disorder. So it's autosomal dominant. Then we'll talk about the pathogenesis of the disease. So all of these etiological factors, what they do is they affect the otic and the labyrinthine capsule. I told you that the inner ear is divided uh, is derived from the otic capsule. So yeah, it affects the otic and the labyrinthine capsule. Now, this causes enlargement of the perivascular space. Enlargement of the perivascular space leads to further bone resorption by osteoclastic activity. We know that the osteoclasts eat up the bone. So there's bone resorption by osteoclast. Then there's new bone deposition by osteocytes. So basically, the osteoclasts are having the bone, they're eating up the bone and the osteocytes are depositing the bone. This, can, this osteoclast, the osteocytes that deposit the bone, uh, this bone has particularly vascular spaces in center and this is called lamella bone. So basically what happened is the otic capsule was affected, there was enlargement of the perivascular space, there was bone resorption by osteoclast, bone deposition by osteocyte. This new bone had vascular spaces and it is called lamella bone. So now what happens with time is that the mucoperiosteum thickens and becomes vascular. So basically the mucoperiosteum, it is now thicker and it is more vascular. So when you see the tympanic membrane, the transparent tympanic membrane, it appears red. So there's a reddish hue. Why? Because it becomes vascular. Now, as the disease advances, there can be any of the three things that uh, is written here. For example, if it involves the bony labyrinth, there's cochlear autosclerosis. If it involves foot play, there's stepedial autosclerosis. And if it involves the round window. So, there are three situations. This was about the pathogenesis of the disease. Now, the type of autosclerosis are four types. The first one is that it involves half of the foot plate. I told you this uh, stepedial autosclerosis, we're talking about that. So types of stepedial autosclerosis. So the first one, it involves half of the foot plate and normal bluish appearance of tympanic membrane. That means that the, uh, the mucoperiosteum thickening in the vascularity is not seen right now. In the second type, more than half of the foot plate is involved and there's thickening of foot plate. In the third type, Almost whole of the foot plate is involved and it appears thickened. And the fourth type, the autosclerotic bone deposited in the entire foot plate, obliter obliterating the oval and the round window. So basically the new bone, that is the new bone deposited by osteocytes, the autosclerotic bone is deposited in the entire foot plate in this complete blockage of the round window or oval window. This was about the pathogenesis and types. Now moving on to the symptoms. Also, uh, we need to know that the fistula uh, antifenistrum is a site of origin. So this is more common and uh, this is the autosclerotic focus is mainly in this region. And this region, this antifenistrum is situated in front of the oval window. 
ante means front so this is the most common site of origin so it originates a little front of the oval window now the symptoms so the first symptom you'll notice is it is a conductive hearing loss now when i say conductive hearing loss that means the bone conduction is better than air conduction so the bone conduction is better the patient hears it, hears his own voice louder how so when you're talking or you're speaking there's movement of your bone or jaw that is transmitted to the inner ear so basically the ac is affected the air conduction is affected and the bone conduction relatively becomes better so you hear your own voice louder then there can be tinnitus if the cochlea is involved and uh, in cochlear it's more common so there will be tinnitus now there's this thing called paracusis villis uh, villi villi so this paracusis villisi now there's this thing called paracusis villisi so what happens in this is a patient tends to hear better in noisy surrounding now you'll ask the question how is it possible so it's a paradox that he's hearing better in noisy surrounding the patient will say that i'm hearing better so why is it happening so what happens is in, you, you know like when there's noisy surrounding you tend to speak louder so if you're in a gathering you'll obviously speak louder so this loudness the patient perceives as uh that he hears better in the noisy surroundings but actually the truth is that the person who, whom he's talking to is speaking louder so he's hearing the voice so this is paracusis villisi now the signs so the tympanic membrane is the uh one that shows the most sign for example normally it's pearly white okay but in 10 percent of the cases we can see the flamingo pink sign in active cases and this is also known as short sign so active cases that means the vascular cases where you see mucoperiosteum vascularity so you can say the flamingo pink sign flamingo pink sign so then the other test renaise will be negative since it's air conduction is uh, the bone conduction is better than air conduction webers is lateralized to the affected area uh, affected ear abc is normal shawbacks is lengthened and gellies is negative and no change in hearing now the pta that is pure tone audiometry there will be ab gap air bone conduction gap and there is a kahat's knot a special characteristic of this uh, pure tone audiometry seen in otosclerosis so what is a kahat's knot it's a dip at 2000 hertz in bone conduction curve in the presence of ab gap now this uh, dip is characteristic of otosclerosis so this makes it easier of diagnosing it now normally what happens is uh, when we are uh, when we are testing the bone conduction so the bone uh, vibrations come to the uh, inner ear and since the foot plate is attached already so this vibration is transmitted to the middle ear through this bone uh, this bone vibration of the inner ear the bony labyrinth vibration now in otosclerosis we know that this bone is fixed so it cannot move so what happens is its contribution decreases and the notch is C. So this is the reason behind the Kahat's notch at two thousand hertz. Now there's just one point you need to know that there's a cookie bite pattern that is seen in mixed hearing loss in cochlear otosclerosis. Now moving on, we have impedance audiometry, and in impedance audiometry, the tympanometry you will see AS type of curve, and the best investigation for this it will be stapedial reflex. It will be absent. So this is the best investigation to diagnose otosclerosis. Now talking about management, so we can divide the management two parts like the active cases and the inactive cases. So talking about the active cases first. So if it's if it is an active case, how will you manage it? So basically, there's no medical treatment for otosclerosis as per treating it completely, but there can be mild management. So in active cases, what will you do? You'll give what does sodium fluoride do? So it has two actions. It stops the destruction. That means the osteoclastic activity is decreased. and decrease in proteolytic enzymes and it increases bone formation and maturation so this is important maturation since we know bone formation is already happening by osteocytes but is it maturing no so increase bone formation and maturation by osteoclast now this was in the active case in the inactive case that means when the tympanic membrane is pearly white you can go for surgeries like a uh, stapedectomy when i say dectomy it means the whole stapes is removed and a prosthesis is placed when i say stapedectomy when i say stapedotomy only suprastructure removed so what do you mean by suprastructure the head neck and crura so there's stape so there is so there is stapes 
dectomy and stapedotomy. So dectomy is the entire, dotomy is the suprastructure. And whole foot plate is made from processes in this too. And the most common material is Teflon. Now, uh, you need to remember one point is that, uh, you need to remember one point that is, uh, operate on the worst ear first and then look for prog progress for one year and then operate on the another year. So if a person has autosclerosis in both the years, what you will do is operate on the worst ear first. Because, you know, if you operate on the better ear and there's complications and there's problem in the surgery, so the person cannot hear, he's left with nothing. So at least leave him with something. So if he operate on the worst year and the prognosis and it works fine and he can start hearing from that year, then you move on to the next year. Now in the non-invasive techniques, you have hearing aids, which can be used and they are proven beneficial. So what are the contraindications for surgery? Uh, so the four most important contraindication is, uh, now this is a person, imagine uh, his this ear is already not functional he cannot hear and this ear has autosclerosis now will you operate on him no so this is the first and most important contraindication why will you not operate because imagine if the uh, operation does not go well and the further complication in the hearing completely goes off that means you what you do from the surgery is make him deaf do you, you don't want that so you'll never operate on only one functional ear which has autosclerosis then the age more than 70, otitis media, pregnancy, you'll not, these are the contraindications, you won't operate. Now the post-op complications that I'm, be, I'm talking about from the past. So post-operative complications, uh, now that is conductive hearing loss, it comes back, so reoccurrence. Now the processes that you placed after surgery is dislodged, so process is dislodged and there's necrosis of incus. Now they can also be fistula formation in the uh, and the perilymph and the sensory neuring hearing loss can occur now type of incisions this is a very short topic just just mentioning it so you have viles incision post oral incision works on master now then you have lempert's incision end oral approach incisora terminalis now i hope you know these places like this is a ear post oral incision will be here you know that end oral approach will be somewhere here and then you have rosen's incision Trans canal incision, not for not for mastoid. So if you're operating on mastoid, obviously you go for post oral incision, right? And uh, this is usually to see an external auditory canal or surgeries where we've approach to external auditory canal and the Rosen's incision. Now post surgery impedance audiometry, AD type of curve will be there. First we had, I told you we had AS type of curve, and after surgery you'll have AD type of curve. Uh, so that was it about autosclerosis. I hope the topic is clear now. Thank you.